to maintain that energy or not to lose the energy in the original sketch. So this is a sketch for bathers. You know, actually sometimes I do like the sketches more than the actual paintings, but um, with bathers, we have uh, these uh, women washing their hair by the sea. They're sort of like the, the three fates or Macbeth's three witches. Uh, the long hair sort of represents uh, the long continuous narrative, unbroken narrative in, in all of my paintings. And uh, here we have a, what seems like a male figure with noodles being extruded from his face. And then he's holding a pair of scissors as if he's about to cut the noodles and the hair. So, you know, noodles in Asian culture is representative of uh, longevity and connectivity. Uh, but as we all know, noodles need to be eaten. And then here's a little Kappa character here. That's from Japanese folklore. Oh, speaking of folklore, there's folklore.la right now. And then uh, in a contrast to the, um, the sea nymphs, we have these turtles, which is also correlated to uh, the elements and the colors in Obanse. Um, so the turtles seem quite phallic, their heads pointed up into the air, kind of singing, they're singing the siren song. And here we have the metaphorical center of the show. So at the center of Obanse is, um, yellow earth. And I worked with uh, Judson Studios to create a new stained glass sculpture. And I wanted to use stained glass because uh, earth is made from molten sand. So it seemed like the perfect medium. And from what Judson tells me, uh, they had never made a uh, freestanding three-dimensional sculpture like this before. So this might be a first. I, I know there have been 3D stained glass sculptures, but none decorated or as elaborate as, as this one. And so we have uh, Gaia, Mother Earth here, and she's holding the conjoined heads of these turtles. And, um, you know, the turtles sort of represent uh, all of the world. All of the world is contained within the turtle shell or on top of the turtle shell. And their heads kind of turn into these fallopian tubes and you have the eggs the orbs popping out there and um here we have a bee also a pollinator in nature so this whole piece is kind of about fertility and and uh, pollination and on the other side opposed to gaia we have this the male entity uh the tiger chasing a butterfly um sort of distracted here I love the the transparency of of the glass and how the light works. And this piece was um, incredibly difficult to make. Uh, we had to figure out a lot of technical innovations to to get this done. So the piece is entirely made out of water jet cut fused glass. Um, you know, all these shapes here in the background are 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 individually cut. Especially these circles, you can't cut these by hand. But the faces are all hand painted and um, are also shaded using an airbrush. And there's imagery on top of the panels as well. Here we have a, a mock up of the stained glass. This is what I made to sort of figure out how to make this thing. Let me see the drawings. And 
Then down this green hallway here, uh, we have works that um, we borrowed from collectors over the years. So this room kind of shows a uh, sense of my history, works from 2008, 2009, 2010. Um, his works are very expressive and uh, abstract at points. And yes, the shipping was insane <laughs> on the show, especially on the large paintings. The canvases are designed to, to fold in half. And then the, uh, the stained glass was also um, very difficult to transport, but we had to figure all of that out. Um, yeah, we actually are trying to design a lamp right now, a small version of Gaia Yellow Earth. So we are in Seoul, Korea right now. There's an older painting called Crickets from 2008 quite like the texture and we have a little volcano i love this little volcano guy oh there's a little fleck let's get that out of there we go don't touch paintings don't touch the paintings at the museum so this old painting wave was kind of inspired by uh casper david friedrich the lone figure kind of facing the sublime landscape. You know, at the time, these painting cherubs were the largest I'd ever done, but now that I look at them, they're, they're kind of small. Yeah, they seem quite difficult to make at the time, but... Oh, here's Maze. This is a classic, a classic painting. I didn't know it would become uh, so popular uh, when I painted it, but here it is, 11 years later, and there is the, uh, the descendant from way back then. So now we continue on. Here are the sketches for the stained glass. And then here's the uh, original drawing, the template that everything was based on. Well, the large paintings in the, um, the big room are, they range from 10 by 30 feet to 11 by 40 something feet. This is an old drawing called Rift. Some of you might have the book that contains this drawing. It pulls a lot of quotes from my interviews over the years. A little embarrassing for me, but, <laughs> but um, hopefully they're illuminating. Uh, here we have a painting called Aurelians. And uh, Aurelian means butterfly collector or someone interested in butterflies. And Aurelian was also a Roman emperor who came from humble beginnings in the military and then uh, ascended to the, the throne. Um, so that's sort of how Aurelian got its meaning. It's like a caterpillar transforming to a butterfly. So from humble beginnings, something amazing can happen. And. Uh, Aureolius means golden, and so that's why we have a golden yellow sky in the background. And I thought it was quite cool that um, we had that butterfly migration in LA recently, and the species of butterfly is called the Painted Lady, and I, I thought of this painting. So there are all these kind of unexpected connections that can be made when when you make a painting. and not knowing what it is you're doing as you're doing it, but at the end, you sort of find all these uh, unintended connections. We have a, this large painting, Adrift. That was on the cover to my book, Paradolia. 
I don't know why all my books have such weird names, but I'm going to try and stop that. <laughs> and so we have a girl stranded on uh, a piece of Taihu rock. Taihu rock is also known as a uh, philosopher's stone. And the rocks are covered in uh, psychedelic graffiti. And this uh, hawk here, or falcon, is um, bring her some driftwood so she can build a raft and escape. And the sky is this acidic uh, camouflage, so I don't know. It's, it's as if the world is uh, turning into a uh, psychedelic fantasy here. Not very natural. And here's another large piece called Pagoda. This was uh, etched wood. Um, I used a laser to etch the lines into the wood, but the process took forever. Uh, this piece was um, was incredibly difficult to make at the time. Um, and I rolled on printmaking ink onto the surface and it started cracking, but I really liked the effect. I was kind of worried how it was going to um, last over the years, but um, we did refurbish it recently. It seemed like everything is looking okay. Nothing is, is falling off, but I love these, these cracks and the texture of the piece. And uh, this is a more recent painting called Rope, sort of inspired by Bruto dancing. And all these pieces here were, were borrowed from, from the collectors and who were generous enough to lend the pieces. And, you know, we had to send people to pick them up and build crates. And this was just a really huge uh, undertaking. And here we have a CG animation that I made for the show. It's kind of a moving version of the Descendants painting. Um, and it features music from No Such Thing. And there are also some small samples of my son's voice and the music. And I wanted the effect of this room to be like uh, a living, breathing painting, so every element is moving and, and heaving as if uh, it's inhaling and, and exhaling. So I call this one uh, Super Bloom Panorama. So also inspired by the recent super blooms we've had in California. Oh, we also have some light leaks and flares happening here. Oh, there we go. Oh. Let's head into This room. So we have this painting bouquet that was featured on the cover of Juxtapose uh, a few years ago and as a centerpiece of the Juxtapose Super Flat Show curated by Takashi Murakami. And an old painting called uh, Nervosa. And this painting is uh, based on the concept of wisdom. Actually, the the guy who commissioned it, he wanted a series of paintings based on the four household gods. And this one is wisdom. The other ones were luck and uh, I forget the other two at the moment. Um, but we had to borrow that piece also. Um, and here we have the Prada room. 
This is the original drawing that I made for the um, collaboration I did in 2007. This is in Seoul, Korea. And uh, the story behind this piece is that, um, you know, I received a few keywords from Mutual Prada. She told me to make something romantic, non-linear, uh, sci-fi, lyrical. And uh, based on the previous collection, which, which had a lot of fake fur and feathers, I decided to use the character Mary here. So we have Mary, and she's searching for her little lamb. And then she sort of travels through this Bashian landscape of carnivorous flowers and, and strange creatures in order to find her lamb. And then uh, at the end, she finally finds her lamb. And the reason why it's so long is because the mural was meant to stretch over an entire city block. And uh, we have some prints here from the resort collection from, uh, I think it was 2018. Bunny print that was used recently. And another Prada drawing. This was used on a scarf that they recently put out. Uh, no, yeah, they insure all the borrowed pieces for the value that um, is appraised. And here we have uh, some more Prada prints and the uh, animation that I, I did for them way back. So some more text about the product collaboration. Here's another painting we borrowed called Ama 2, which is uh, based on these uh, Japanese pearl divers. I got really, this one's pretty detailed, dense. And the Painting Traveler, which was borrowed from the collector. And it's kind of funny because actually he hasn't ever had the painting in his possession. Because <laughs> after I finished the painting, I just I kept it in the studio because I knew it would have to ship to the show. So he actually has never had this painting. Um, but, now it's in, but now it's in the museum. Uh... Here's a sketch. Yeah, we'll be getting to the comic covers shortly. Oh, and here we have a quote from Takashi Murakami. Um, here are some skateboards I painted just a few days before the show. It's kind of insane. There's some interesting texture happening here. Fables room. Actually, here's the, uh, the education room. Oh, we have some kids coloring here. So you come here and create your own works. We have we have this quote here. The covers were the laboratory of images. It's amazing they, they took some design elements from my covers and created this elaborate signage here. And uh, this exhibit is pretty cool. They uh, made this custom display here. Everything was built out custom for the show. So you can see all the covers I've done over the years. 
Oh, I see an Umbrella Academy in this corner. Umbrella Academy, you can watch it on, uh, watch it on Netflix. Right, we got Fables. We got Batgirl. We got Batman. I don't know if some of you remember this, probably not. This book didn't do very well when it came out. We got LeBron James. We got The Runaways. We got Amazing Fantasy from Marvel. And here we have uh, movie posters. Movie posters, oh, time lapse. Blade Runner poster. We got Shape of Water, Mother, Blade Runner. And this one has got that holographic foil happening. And I did a new poster for this Korean movie called Divine Fury that's going to be coming out this summer. So. I don't know if some of you know this guy, uh, Pak Sol Jun uh, Sungi. He's kind of the Robert De Niro of Korea. And this other guy, Do Hwan. And uh, I'll get all these faces. I don't think I've ever painted this many faces on a cover before. And we've got a lot of hands, spirits reaching out. And this is the uh, original acrylic painting for the piece. And, uh, and we have sketches for the descendant. This is a fiberglass sculpture of the descendants. And Slingshot Boy. So uh, Slingshot has a lot of obvious allegorical references like David and Goliath and Hammurabi's code of retaliation and eye for an eye but I think for me the slingshot boy represents aiming for your your creative ambitions but then also representing the self-sacrifice it takes to get there and we have his eyes on the wall over here so he's shooting he's shooting the the walls around him. And we are entering the end of the show. Some water, another view of the descendant. And I think that's it. Wow, that took a lot longer than I thought it was going to take. But I think we're finished now. Okay, thanks for joining me. I think we're going to end pretty soon. I think the museum is open right now. People are coming in. And we're back at the entrance. Okay, well... See you guys later.